Ah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good evening to uh, to some of us as well. Uh, my name is Louise White. Um, I'm working in the energy efficiency team in the European Investment Bank. So today, I just want to give you an overview of Elena because this is one of the technical assistance facilities that's being run out of the team that I'm working in. Um, and I think it's very relevant for the, the local energy uh, focus that we're discussing today. So uh, next slide, please. Oh, next slide, please. <laughs> So what is Elena? So European Local Energy Assistance. It's a facility that was set up uh, between the European Investment Bank and the Commission about 10 years ago, over 10 years ago now. And what it is, is a grant to support the preparation of energy efficiency related projects. So that's important to note that it's not a grant for, for the investments themselves, it's a grant for the preparation. And um, any public or private body is able to, to apply for it um, as long as it's being used to prepare an energy saving investment program. So to date, um, nearly 210 million euro has been awarded in grant, and that is supporting over 7 billion euros worth of investment on the ground. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on, on each of those aspects now, but that's essentially what Elena is. So who can have benefit? Well, it was initially set up for public bodies. So any local, regional or national authority uh, could apply. Um, and also entities like energy agencies, which are also very involved in um, energy saving programs. It's also possible to have a group of such bodies to apply, but um, it would always be one entity that would sign the end contract. So partnerships are allowed, but then one would take responsibility for the overall um, legal contract. It's since been opened to private bodies. Um, and what that means in practice is um, a lot of the time it's housing associations um, who would be involved in implementing energy efficiency type of investments. And we also now have banks who are also an, um, an intermediary to smaller projects on the ground, again, mostly for the residential sector, but some also for SMEs. Um, for private bodies, uh, it's really important to note that Elena is, is European Commission money, so it's not there to just finance business as usual or to make a profit. It's really that there has to be a, some public benefit and you're going over and above what you would do in your normal business. However, I think it's fair to say that these entities can now play quite a, an important role in, in this overall aim as well to increase these types of projects. Uh, next slide, please. So what do you get with Elena? Well, first thing to note is that it's given out on a first come, first served basis. So there is no calls or calls for tenders. You, you essentially co contact the European Investment Bank. And once you start the process, then applicants work with a designated contact to get the project application ready until it can be uh, requested to the commission. And this is important to note because ultimately it's commission money and they have the final say. So this whole process is what takes the longest. But in this process, what we're really doing is making sure that, first of all, that the project is eligible. It takes all the boxes for what Elena is supposed to support. And secondly, that has a, a very realistic chance of resulting in end investment on the ground, because this is a very important aspect for Elena. It's a grant that's used to prepare investments. So we have this leverage factor obligation, which I'll discuss in a little bit more detail. But essentially what it means is that every euro of grant has to be directly related to a um, euro of investment on the ground. So once the commission approve, what Elena gives the party is 90% coverage of your preparation costs. The applicant is asked to um, cover 10% themselves. And that's also to have you know, skin in the game. So I think it's, it, it's never an actual issue, but it's an important symbol because it shows that it's a partnership there as well. 
Um, and then the eligible activities are quite wide. They're essentially anything that is needed to prepare the investment. So a lot of the time it's for feasibility studies, uh, energy audits, um, and a lot of also on communication or, or tender processes, because tender processes can be quite a lot of work to prepare and publish, but they're crucial for a lot of these investments to actually happen. So next slide, please. And here you can see how that is done. So a lot of the time uh, you will have internal staff covered by, by your Elena budget. And this is important because your internal staff are the ones who, who know the project. But what Elena allows you to do is you can dedicate them full time are part time to work exclusively on, um, on, on the preparation of the project. Uh, and then it, they're paid at the normal rate that they would be. So it's, it's, it's uh, no difference to them. Uh, but then more also very important is that if there are some missing gaps in skill or expertise in house, what you can do is hire short term experts. So these are short term consultants that are paid for with the Elena grant, and then they really help to make sure that other activities that can't be covered in house can be done. So a lot of the time this would be structuring of the program from a legal and financial aspect. Um, as I mentioned, prep preparation of the tender procedures can also be um, quite a lot of work. And then any other technical or feasibility or communication studies that are needed in order to get this program off the ground. So these are just the main categories, but I think you can think of Elena as anything before the tender or the investment contract, anything that's needed up until that point can generally be covered by your Elena grant. Next slide, please. And then the types of investment programs that um, it, it helps to prepare. There are three, um, three envelopes. Um, and I mentioned this simply because it's relevant for that leverage factor I mentioned earlier. Every euro of grant has to be linked to a euro of investment. And for the sustainable energy envelope, that leverage factor is 20. So for every 1 million euro of grant, we would expect to have 20 million euro of investments in these categories here. So you have renovations of buildings, uh, street lighting projects, um, renewable energy in, in, in so much as they are integrated into the buildings. So this Elena is not for standalone wind farms or standalone renewables. Um, and then investments in district heating uh, cooling networks. So this, this is the sustainability energy, sustainable energy envelope. And this leverage factor uh, of 20 is, 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 is what's kind of the, the, the main Elena. Then if you move into the next slide, please. And then we also have um, an envelope specifically dedicated to the residential sector. And this is a leverage factor of 10 uh, to acknowledge that a lot of the time these projects will be of a smaller nature as well. So every 1 million euro of grant is linked to 10 million euro of investment. And it's essentially anything to do with the renovation of residential buildings. Um, a lot of time as well, what goes into this uh, particular type of project is preparation of, um, is, is, is financing energy audits and the preparation and setting up of one-stop shops, which is a mechanism that seems to work quite well for this sector because you just have one place where a homeowner can go and get all the financial and technical advice it needs or he or she needs um, to implement these energy efficiency measures in their house. So that's the second one. And then the last one, next slide, please. And then there's also an envelope for transport. Again, this has a leverage factor of 10. Um, and this is to support um, the use of sustainable or the implementation of sustainable techno uh, technical solutions in the transport sector. So a lot of the time now it's to do with the uh, electrification of transport, recharging infrastructure. And then there's also, um, projects that are looking at intelligent transport systems and integration of services. So um, on an urban level, it's, you know, if you have a ticket, you'll be able to move seamlessly from a bus to a tram to a train. But the logistics behind all of that takes quite a lot of work. So uh, cities have large scale 
transport investment programs and Elena will be able to support anything that is um, trying to, 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 to implement something that's innovative for that city. So these are the main three envelopes for uh, that for the for the for the grant supporting different slightly different types of energy efficiency investment programs. So next slide, please. And then just as an overview of the main rules, um, generally what we're looking at are investment programs of in the range of 30 million euro. Um, it, as I said, it's first come, first served. And just so you get a sense of the type of grants that are being um, approved every year, it's between 30 to 50 million euros per year. So this is the grants amount that are being signed between the EIB and, and final beneficiaries. Um, but just to point out as well that for these projects to get approved, there is a required level of maturity that is needed, and this is to do with this leverage factor obligation. So in this um, interaction between the EIB and the project at the beginning, what we're really trying to make sure is that with Elena support, this project will result in real investment on the ground, and that can take a little bit of time. Um, the issue is if this leverage isn't achieved, um, there is the possibility for you to have to pay some of the money back. And obviously this is not something that's common and we want to avoid it. So this is the main reason for that. But it should be noted as well that the investment doesn't necessarily have to come from the person or entity signing the Elena contract. Where the money comes from is irrelevant, but when you sign the contract, you're making the commitment that this investment should take place. Um, and the time frame is generally three or four year time. So next slide, please. So just to give you a practical example of a real project on the ground, um, there was one that recently finished in uh, Slovenia. This was a local energy agency and it used an LNA grant of just over 2 million to help prepare um, investments across 33 municipalities. So this energy agency really worked quite hard to implement a big coordination effort in order to prepare these investments. And a lot of the Elena work uh, went into paying the staff who were helping municipalities prepare their investments. A lot of it was to do with uh, tender and public procurement documentation and also um, developing templates for contracts that, that municipalities could use. So um, this was one example of, of a recent enough project. And then in the next slide, you can see one that was implemented in France. And this was more in the residential sector. And this was to do with setting up a one-stop shop um, that was helping homeowners to implement energy efficiency renovations in their in their homes. So a grant of 1.6 million and the investment was was over 33 million euro. And again, this is a program that was was very much um, not just an Elena project. There was EIB financing alongside it as well, and it was still it's still ongoing. So Elena was there to, to help that get it off the ground. But just because the Elena contract end doesn't mean that these entities also stop. So um, moving on to the next slide, which I think is my final one. Um, okay, this is just a slide to show you that um, if you want more information on any of the projects, Elena projects, go on to the EIB um, website. There's a whole section dedicated to Elena and on the map you can click on any of the ongoing or completed projects and just get an overview so you can see the types of practical projects that, that um, this facility is supporting. And next slide please. So just in summary, um, the facility itself um, is, uh, is one that's seen as quite successful um, in that because it covers 90% of the costs, it offers some real advantages to projects that are nearly there, but just need that extra push to make something actually reali realizable on the ground. It is first come, first served, so the project's process will move um, as, as quickly as the information can be agreed between um, the, the European Investment Bank and the project, and then ultimately it's given to the Commission for approval. As I mentioned, it does require a, a level of maturity, so if you're very early on in the stage, Elena is not for you, but I would 
also say that um, there is an Elena email. Uh, my address is also on the slides at the back, back of this. So we are very much open to just having some general conversations and to having initial consultations. And then we can discuss directly whether this is something that would be of interest to you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louise, for the presentation and the overview of what Elena does and how it supports cities and uh, regional decision makers. Um, I just wanted to say we will, of course, share all the slides so everybody in the audience uh, will have access to your contact details um, and we will share that um, later after the event. Um, we don't have much time for questions, unfortunately, but Louise, I have one, one question for you. You, you said um, that one of the preconditions is that there is a real public benefit from the projects which Elena is supporting. Um, can you talk about how this is really being monitored? monitored? Sometimes it's really hard to, to uh, well, measure something as abstract as a public benefit. Does uh, Elena have a specific methodology for that or, or, or how does that work? Yeah, maybe I was a bit loose with my words there because it's not like we're measuring the public benefit. The point there was that Elena is not just for a private entity to subsidize their costs uh, over, a, over the period if they weren't doing something in addition to what they would normally do. But however, it must also be pointed out that when you when you sign up to Elena, there are a, quite a lot of monitoring um, indicators that we ask for. So every six months, uh, you have to send us a report. We discuss how the project is going and all of that information is made public and goes back to the commission. So the types of projects that we're looking for have to have real energy savings and have to have real greenhouse gas emissions, renewable energy production. So there is a quite strict monitoring procedure. So what I meant, well, that was more what I meant by that comment. Okay, thank you very much. And um, this last slide, which you showed with this uh, beautiful map with all of the individual dots of the projects, um, is that quite a detailed database? So can the audience go to this web page and find yeah. out a lot about the projects which uh, have been supported and, and maybe get some inspiration well, as well? Yeah, well, essentially, it's 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 deliberately just kept to a two pager for each project, so you get the main details of what the money is used for, the the the, the you know where it is, what it's doing, what Elena is doing, and then in each one there's a contact email. So it's meant to be when you sign up for Elena that you also agree to discuss your project with anyone else who's interested for exactly that same reason. If it's replicable somewhere else, maybe it's something that others could get inspiration from. So you do get a very good overview of the project, but if you want more information, you contact the person themselves or, or, or you come back to us and we can also try to sort that out for you. Okay, excellent. Well, that's been a great source of inspiration and hopefully a really helpful tool for all the participants. And uh, yes, we can of course add the link to the database. Maybe we can also um, organize this to put it also again into the chat or we'll share it with the follow-up email. We'll make sure that you get um, the link to that. Um, thanks again, Louise, for your uh, presentation. Before we go across the Atlantic, um, at least from, from my perspective being based here in Brussels, um, I just would like to launch a very quick poll, a second uh, question. And uh, if you could, Janne, please launch that in, in the background. Um, the question is, how can international collaboration and exchange benefit best the municipal and local projects? You can um, click more than one answer. Um, and if you think um, you would like to add something, then just click on other and put your addition into the chat. Just say poll two and put whatever other answer you want to give into the chat. Unfortunately, the polling tool on, on Zoom doesn't allow to put it directly into the uh, response options. Um, and uh, while you are filling in that poll, I would like to introduce our next speakers because we will have a double presentation without me interrupting. And our Two speakers um, will talk about the programs in the US, which are closely associated and managed by the Federation of Canadian 
Municipalities FCM. And our first speaker is Yi Liu, who's a senior manager at the Green Municipal Fund, uh, which is uh, a project and an initiative um, launched and supported by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And he will then be supported by Oscar Espinoza, who's a senior advisor at the Low Carbon Cities Canada in initiative, the, the LC3 initiative, which is also closely linked um, to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, but I think it's Yi Liu who's starting. But before we start, if we could just quickly see the results of the poll, if that was possible. Aha, uh -huh. there is a lot of support for sharing good practices. And hopefully this is what we're doing here uh, today. And um, a lot of support also, and a lot of interest in creating a wider network, network of experts. Now, this is also what we're trying to do with this webinar series. And of course, I'm fully aware that physical meetings where you can have a chat over a coffee in a, in a break would be much, much better than having these webinars. But um, hopefully it helps you to a certain degree, at least to establish new contacts and either through LinkedIn. And a number of you have requested also participants lists. We will share the participants list, but again, also the, only those names who have requested and agreed that their details will be shared. And we're not sharing um, a lot of details. We are essentially sharing the name and the uh, affiliation so that you can expand your network of contacts and the network of collaboration. And so then without any further delay from my side, I would like to hand over the floor to Yi Liu and Oscar Espinoza for the double presentation for the next 20 minutes. Thank you gentlemen for joining us uh, today and I look forward to your contribution. Thank you, Oliver, for, for that introduction. I'm excited to be here with uh, Oscar to share with you more about the uh, the GMF, uh, Green Municipal Fund, as well as the LC3 program. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, NRCAN and BPIE uh, for partnering on this Canada EU webinar uh, series and for the opportunity to co-present with uh, Elena. Uh, if we go to the next slide. so. <clears throat> the, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is the national voice uh, of Canadian municipalities. We represent uh, 2,000 members um, in every part of Canada's 10 provinces and three territories. Uh, our members have very diverse needs and experiences. Nearly 80% are rural, remote, and northern communities, uh, with the remaining 20% representing the vast majority of Canadians in Canada's larger cities. Uh, so as an organization, we represent more than 90% of Canadians. Next slide, please. So our programs uh, are what really truly set, sets us apart from other types of uh, advocacy organizations. Uh, the Green Municipal Fund uh, is our flagship program for funding municipal sustainability solutions. Um, we also have other infrastructure oriented programs such as asset management and climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, we do, uh, we have programs such as the Partners for Climate Protection and the uh, collaboration with uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors. Uh, furthermore, we also have programs in other policy areas such as uh, our international programs and women in local government. Uh, if we skip. Uh, and then one more. So the, the Green Municipal Fund was created uh, 20 years ago uh, as an endowment. Um, so in, in 2000, to support municipalities in addressing climate change and broader sustainability in communities. Uh, we do this by focusing on three things. Uh, number one, direct funding in the form of grants and loans. Two, sustainability initiatives to support everything from uh, the project origination work of plans, feasibility studies, uh, to testing of solutions through pilots and full-blown capital projects. Uh, number two, we also provide capacity building and knowledge support. So uh, it's not just about putting money on the table, it's also about making sure that the finite dollars are well invested to make municipal budgets go as far as possible and optimize success of our initiatives. 
Uh, we do this by mobilizing lessons learned from past projects uh, and developing programming to advance specific knowledge, skills, and competencies where, where we've identified gaps. Uh, finding ways to leverage more. So, and then the, the last item we do uh, is finding ways to leverage more capital into, uh, into the sector. Um, municipalities are, are often called upon as frontline uh, agents to deal with many societal changes, but they have limited financial tools and resources. So GMF and FCM supports uh, the sector in filling that capital gap by trying to leverage investments from non-municipal sources. Uh, GMF is managed by the FCM uh, with oversight from Natural Resources Canada, Infrastructure Canada, and uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, since our inception, GMF has approved <clears throat> more than 946 million um, in investments uh, and resulting in reductions uh, of GHGs by 2.7 megatons, uh, amongst other benefits. Um, Next slide, please. So GMF supports uh, innovative initiatives centered on the uh, energy, waste, uh, water, land use, and transportation um, sectors. Uh, our, our funding is supportive of innovative large uh, and small municipalities trying new things. Uh, however, given finite funding and, and the very broad spectrum of innovations across all sectors, uh, it's hard to get to critical mass and scale. <clears throat> so in 2019, uh, GMF's mandate grew uh, to include four new initiatives that are meant to support municipalities to, to better uh, get to scale on specific types of projects that will drive uh, cost-saving energy efficiency in, uh, in communities across across Canada. Uh, this resulted in four initiatives, uh, the community efficiency financing, sustainable affordable housing, community building retrofits, and low carbon cities Canada. Uh, I will go deeper in detail on the first three initiatives and Oscar will share uh, information on the fourth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> oh, if we go back just one. So one of the many examples um, that I wanted to share of a municipality demonstrating leadership is the city of Rennes uh, in Quebec that built Canada's first net zero energy library through a project that we provided funding uh, to between 2013 and 2015. Uh, we, we, pro we were supportive, but the municipality also worked with NRCAN's uh, CAMET Energy Labs uh, in Rennes and Concordia University on the project. Uh, and based on the experience of this project, um, it, it's having lasting impacts in that the city of Rennes plans to apply similar sustainability standards to future municipal buildings. Next slide, please. So uh, first I'll cover the community efficiency financing. Uh, if we skip a couple. Perfect. So um, our... 300 million um, community efficiency financing, CEF initiative, uh, helps municipalities create, launch, and expand innovative financing programs for home energy projects. We work very closely with um, uh, our NRCAN and Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, CMHC colleagues, uh, to ensure alignment and complementarity with their funding towards scaling up home retrofits uh, in our communities. Uh, CEF is a program of programs and that uh, it supports municipalities to expand or uh, establish or expand innovative financing programs that support homeowners uh, in making energy improvements to their homes. Uh, GMF does not directly engage or contract at the individual property level. Next slide. <clears throat> at a very high level, we have two main objectives. One is to uh, is obtaining and, and creating triple bottom line benefits in terms of helping reduce uh, energy um, energy use um, and GHG intensity in buildings, supporting local job creation and housing affordability and improving building quality and quality of life for residents. Uh, the second is really centered around um, market transformation. Uh, CEF aims to help provide 
uh, proof of concept for different, uh, oh, sorry, go, thank you, for, for different financing models uh, in Canada uh, with the aim of growing and expanding the market by building confidence and expertise to uh, attract private capital to these programs. Um, next slide now, thank you. So what do we mean when we talk about energy financing <clears throat> programs? Uh, at its core, it's about creating a program with built-in financing options and other services to help homeowners upgrade the home energy performance of their homes, uh, either through energy efficiency measures, uh, renewable energy installations, or a combination of the two. Uh, some common models we, we're seeing uh, include, for example, property assessed clean energy, also known as PACE. Uh, with this model, loan repayment is secured by a lien added to the property tax uh, assessment. Uh, we are also seeing uh, utility on bill financing as well as direct lending models. Uh, the key thing to note is that financing programs cannot thrive uh, in an unorganized ecosystem. Uh, so as such, CEF is designed to offer much more by extending resources to help communities set up uh, enduring local programs for years to come uh, that provide activities such as uh, establishing uh, renovation contractor networks, training for energy advisors, concierge services, uh, and to guide homeowners and consume uh, through through the renovation process. Uh, this is very similar to the one-stop shops that Euro and uh, uh, Louise spoke to earlier in the EU context. Um, next slide, please. Um, so FCM and the federal government recently announced over 40 million in approved funding for nine SEP projects uh, representing uh, large urban municipalities as well as small rural municipalities in five provinces. Uh, we're also working with numerous other municipalities that are looking to design and stand up their own programs. Uh, one notable example is City of Toronto's Home Energy Loan Program. Uh, it's one of the pioneer Canadian programs along with Halifax's Solar City Program. Uh, the Toronto Health Program was launched in 2014. Funding from CEF uh, will help with expansion and enhancement of the existing program, which aims to reach uh, more homeowners and, and result in deeper retrofits. Uh, so moving on. So on the Sustainable Affordable Housing Program, um, this is our... Um, initiative. It's, it's another $300 million initiative focused on making more energy efficient affordable housing stock available. Uh, this funding and capacity building initiative means uh, municipalities and community non-for-profits can build more energy efficient affordable housing stock and retrofit their current stock. Uh, they can reduce GHGs um, from affordable housing while lowering operating operational costs uh, and residents' energy costs. Next slide. In terms of objectives, um, environmental objectives are at the core of this program uh, and triple bottom line benefits of the offer have focused each aspect uh, of the, uh, on the positive impacts of energy efficiency and other sustainability measures, uh, even through an economic and social lens. Uh, it's intended that the environmental projects that we fund reduce utility, uh, utilities and operating costs and improve residential, resident health and comfort. Uh, and in addition, uh, we aim to build the affordable housing sector's capacity to undertake these types of projects. Uh, the offer was designed to be stackable uh, with and to complement the uh, initiatives of the National Housing Strategy. Um, it's, it's, um, it's specifically designed to incent and enable providers to incorporate energy efficiency measures and GHG reduction in their projects. Uh, next slide. Um, a, a few days ago, um, a few days ago, the uh, FCM and the Government of Canada announced the funding of 34 grants to support plans, studies, and pilots in communities of all sizes across Canada. Uh, these amendments ensure energy efficiency and GHG emission reductions are incorporated at the earliest stages of project development and will be developed to higher environmental standards. Two examples of the projects we funded are presented on the slide, uh, including the YWCA of uh, Banff in Alberta 
uh, they're building a net zero complex of 33 high quality family oriented units. Uh, this project uses innovative shipping container module, modular design with an efficient building envelope, uh, solar PV system and heat recovery me mechanics. Uh, and then the second one is the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, which is designing their first net zero energy affordable housing development. So, uh, the last initiative that I will speak to prior to passing over to Oscar is a community building retrofit. Um, if we go to the next slide, thank you. So GMFs, uh, this is a $167 million initiative helping municipalities to optimize the energy performance of community buildings such as arenas and recreation centers uh, and reduce GHG emissions. We were working closely with our infrastructure Canada and Canadian Infrastructure Bank's uh, colleagues to ensure alignment and complementarity with their programs, uh, broadly aimed at encouraging energy efficiency uh, and GHG reductions in public sector buildings. Um, next slide. In terms of the objectives, uh, from a triple bottom line perspective, we fund energy retrofits to, uh, to significantly cut their GHG emissions and make operations more affordable. Uh, while extending the life of these important community cultural facilities. In terms of supporting market transformation, we're empowering municipalities that may not otherwise consider energy efficiency measures uh, through building monitoring and analysis grants and existing building recommissioning to better understand the, their energy performance and improve the operations of their buildings. Uh, and furthermore, we are providing studies and capital project funding for municipalities that aim to retrofit a building using an outcomes oriented approach to achieve near net zero carbon buildings over time. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is the most recently launched program. Uh, however, so we, we don't have any announcements of, of projects just yet, but we, we do have examples of previously GMF funded projects that fall within the same category. Uh, for example, the small village of Midway in southern BC is retrofitting their community center, which was used as an important hub for emergency services during wildfires in, in 2015 to, into a net zero ready uh, facility. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to, uh, to Oscar. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here. If you can move on to the next slide, please. <laughs> so. Um, for those who have participated over the course of this webinar series, uh, we've heard about the Government of Canada's efforts to support um, energy efficiency initiatives, but also its ambitions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, with a new target of 40 to 45% GHG reductions um, below 2005 levels by 2030, um, and a vision to reach net zero status by 2050. Next slide, please. So needless to say, um, these ambitions represent a challenge of significant scale and urgency that requires collaboration across all sectors and all levels of government. And at the center of it all are our cities, who are responsible for a large proportion of our total GG emissions, um, which is why accelerating the pace and the scale of urban climate action is crucial to meet uh, those targets. The LC3 network aims to address the scale of uh, that challenge uh, with a mandate to catalyze the identification, incubation, and widespread adoption of low carbon solutions. Um, now, the network is a partnership among seven centers, which are hosted by nonprofit or bespoke organizations in seven city regions across Canada, which you can see in the map, um, working in collaboration with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities um, in an effort to address the systemic barriers that are preventing us for the full scale adoption of low carbon solutions and ultimately help cities reduce their GHG emissions and accelerate our transition to net zero and beyond. Um, now, the notion of a network is actually one of the LC3's key assets. Um, first, because having a decentralized and, and locally focused centers provides access to practitioners across Canada and allows them to leverage different approaches and different conditions while still being responsive and driven by local priorities and needs. Um, but secondly, because the centers are able to um, increase their capacity and amplify their collective impact um, by having access to share resources, investment opportunities, and programs that are explicitly designed to scale up and replicate uh, in different cities. Next slide, please. 
So the other key asset to this collaboration model is the LC3 endowment, uh, which was provided by the government of Canada and is to be managed in perpetuity. So while the endowment model is not new to GMF, as my colleague was saying, the funds provided a new opportunity to create synergies and economies of scale within the network. Um, but it also brings about a mandate and acts as a means to mobilize and leverage additional resources from diverse partners in Canada's largest urban centers. Um, the collaboration model also includes another national voice, uh, with the federal government inviting the Green Municipal Fund to host the program, uh, given FCM's experience and, and reach in the municipal sector, as well as its alignment with LC3's mandate. Now, um, by establishing what is called the LC3 National Office, GMF plays a dual role. Um, first, we have a, an oversight and accountability role, serving as the liaison with the federal, uh, with the government of Canada on behalf of the LC3 network. And this includes establishing governance mechanisms and advisory bodies, um, managing the transfer of funds to each of the new centers and reporting on their activities and outcomes. But more importantly, the national office plays a supporting role. So we act as a learning hub to encourage collaboration and knowledge mobilization both within and beyond the network um, and identify and procure any relevant services, research or expertise that might be needed on behalf of and for the benefit of the network. And then at the local level, the funds are overseen by local governance boards, investments and advisory committees, um, including representation from partner municipalities. So each center would then utilize and further their endowment uh, by seeking match funding and direct investment initiatives and use those returns to fund grants, research and other initiatives to reduce GAG emissions in their respective um, communities. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to the endowment model, um, LC3's approach is also modeled on decades of experience thanks to our colleagues at the Atmospheric Fund. Um, TAF was the first of its kind, uh, established through an endowment from the City of Toronto in 1991. Um, in, and they have since been managing and investing and demonstrating and scaling up low carbon solutions in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Um, their approach includes impact investment, grants, influencing policies, and running programs, uh, which served to inspire others who were eager to learn how this could be replicated in their cities, uh, which led to the idea of LC3 and a funding proposal to the federal government uh, and its creation in budget 2019. Um, next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this particular challenge is not one that LC3 or any other organization can tackle alone and actually requires collaboration, new collaboration and partnership models such as the one seen today. Um, but above all, it will require a multi-solving, multi-level and cross-sectoral approach to our work. So more than ever, we recognize that our work is and should be um, an opportunity to advance not only environmental, but the many social and economic objectives that communities are striving for across the country, uh, whether this is housing affordability, equity and inclusion outcomes, or the creation of more jobs. So it's precisely this thinking that is behind our vision and our role as enablers and accelerators of the systemic and structural changes that are needed to achieve that scale and direct us towards and beyond the net zero target. And while we have a clear mandate to enable accelerating this transition to net zero, we also recognize the importance of doing so through a community benefits lens. So positioning GHG reductions as one of multiple benefits, an approach that supports, um, that supports more durable and more equitable solutions for all Canadians. So since I know I'm a little bit over time, I will just say that for those who are keen to learn more on, on our progress and the initiative supported over time, I invite you to follow up uh, LC3 on social media. And if there are any uh, if you are in the seven regions of the LC3s, make sure to keep an eye on any uh, news specific to the LC3 in your uh, locality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oscar and uh, Yiliu. Um, the good news here is you had to rush a little bit through your presentation, but the good news is that all the Canadian cities, which we're going to have in the breakout groups, are also members of LC3. So I'm sure we can dive into some more details in, in the breakout groups. But before we go into them, I, I just have uh, one or two questions coming in from uh, the chat. And there is one directly um, directed to you, Yi. It's uh, the question whether the sustainable affordable housing initiative whether this is for individual housing projects uh, or whether it can also be used for whole bundles of projects and, and measures to create programs could you clarify that please 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question, uh, Oliver and, and Sean. Um, as I was kind of mentioning in the chat, uh, the, the way the, the initiative is structured, uh, it is primarily to fund uh, projects. So uh, if, you, if you look at the feasibility studies, pilots and, and capital projects, it's, it's structured in a similar way as uh, project oriented funding uh, that uh, the GMF has. Uh, we do have a planning grant that's really meant to help municipalities and housing providers look across our portfolio and, and really uh, reach for the energy efficiency and, and GHG uh, ambitions. Uh, however, uh, if there are applicants that are interested in a portfolio, uh, kind of an aggregation approach, I would recommend speaking to us uh, about those because it, it is one of those things that we are really trying to encourage broadly within the GMF uh, is uh, moving more and more away from one-off projects to the ability to, to deliver a portfolio or, or, or a program uh, that, that gets to, uh, you know, on, on scale, on pace uh, to what we need to get to, uh, to net zero. Thanks. And maybe just a, a really quick uh, second question. Um, there was a question on uh, pace and on build financing. Um, did you experience or do you experience uh, a large take up uh, to these uh, financing instruments or is are there some barriers is it difficult to to roll this really out in a in a mass market way so, so that's that's a great question i i would say um the uh, home energy retrofits um ecosystem uh, is less mature in canada than in the united states uh, in the U.S., it's uh, it's viewed as a uh, it is a billion dollar uh, plus industry, uh, and in Canada, uh, recently we've had uh, it's much more uh, more new in terms of um, it's much newer in terms of a few experiences we've had, for example, with the pioneer programs of uh, Toronto uh, Help Program and the Halifax Solar City. Uh, I, I had a, a request to kind of explain how it works. Uh, and in essence, it's the ability for a homeowner uh, to retrofit uh, their homes, but instead of putting up the capital themselves or, or taking a loan from the bank, uh, it gets uh, assessed and uh, against the, the property uh, uh, as a tax assessment so that uh, the homeowner can benefit from not having to pay the upfront capital um, they, they repay through the, the property tax uh, and they get the benefits of the, the savings. One of the main benefits of the PACE uh, program is that uh, it moves with the property to a subsequent homeowner. So if you know that you're selling your property uh, in two to three years, it's still worth undertaking some of these longer payback um, investments. Uh, so it really is more enabling of a, a deep retrofit uh, approach. In Canada, it has to be provincially, it has to be enabled by provincial legislation. So there's a, a, a different landscape there, uh, and which is part of why with the community efficiency financing program, the way we designed it as a program of programs, uh, it uh, really focused on the local program is a recognition for, for the diverse local context, uh, whether it's um, uh, the provincial legislation, but also whether or not uh, your municipality has established uh, renovate, renovation networks, um, the, the dynamics of uh, homeowners and uh, uh, et cetera. So the focus there is really to build on some of the early successes we've seen uh, in the Toronto and Halifax program, but really let these programs design uh, towards the uh, objectives that they're aiming for in support of, of their communities. Uh, and with this, uh, in terms of achieving the critical mass that we talked to earlier, uh, we have, a, we have um, you know, we've announced nine of these projects and, and there's several more communities working towards um, establishing or expanding their programs. And we have a community of practice where they really get to share some of the lessons learned uh, and build upon, uh, upon that network to, to enhance their programs, uh, to, to really share some of the lessons such as um, one of the things we've heard a lot is it, it's not just a financing. Uh, if you put a financing product into an undeveloped ecosystem, 
uh, then the chances of success, success is, mm -hmm. is quite limited. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, you're, you're saying really uh, tailoring it to the local conditions is one of the criteria to, to really enable success. That's very important. Now, we, of course, could spend uh, much more time to discuss the details, but we're actually going to move into breakout groups. And I already saw uh, a short comment from, from Steph Rule, uh, who will... Um, speak in one of the breakout groups. He's from, from Utrecht. and uh, Utrecht actually also just uh, got support from the Elena project. So, uh, at, sorry, the Elena program. So we're making all these, these practical links looking at the implementation. Um, we are going to spend now a good half hour in these breakout groups. And I just want to explain what's going to happen. So we will have different, uh, well, speakers um, who will give a really short introduction, but then uh, be available as a resource to talk about their um, municipal situations and their experiences. We have uh, Juan from Edmonton. We have Stuart and Ray Ann from Toronto. We have Janice from Ottawa. We have Sean from Vancouver, Paul from Lille, um, Alejandro from Valencia, Steph from Utrecht and Sabrina from Dublin. And um, all breakout groups will be facilitated by additional people. Uh, you know who you are, so I'm not going to introduce you now uh, because I will introduce you after the breakout groups when I will ask you just briefly to give me the one highlight, the one most impressive story or program you've heard in your breakout group. So we will literally do a 30 seconds per breakout group reporting back to make sure that we land with the end of this webinar at the next uh, full hour. And so now with some Zoom magic, hoping that it's going to work, you will all be automatically allocated to one city group. I wish you a good discussion and hope that everything works. And then we will meet again, again, automatically. You will automatically uh, be brought back into the plenary so you don't have to press any buttons. Just stay online, just stay present, and uh, we will meet again in about uh, half an hour from now. So if my colleagues could press the buttons to split us up into the breakout groups, it should hopefully...
Wonderful. It seems that technology is working and we're all coming slowly back. I see um, people are still entering the plenary again. So let's just give ourselves 10, 15 seconds or so to wait until everybody is here before we have a final 10 minute uh, wrap up of this webinar. And so just to give our um, facilitators a, a, a heads up warning, um, I just want to go into the order, which I have here on, on my list. I'm starting at the bottom. I will ask Catherine, Lawrence, Victoria, Katie, Chessie, Frank, Rutger, and Caroline in that order for a quick feedback what the most impressive uh, program or initiative uh, or the most surprising program or initiative is which you discussed and which you heard about in your um, breakout session. And Catherine, um, you were facilitating um, the discussion about Dublin where Sabrina Decker um, spoke. Catherine, can I invite you to give us a literally a 30 seconds highlight? Hi, Oliver. Um, in the Dublin group, we were a small group. We discussed many initiatives, uh, but one thing that was really highlighted is how energy performance contracting are very, very effective way to meet our targets and um, how they could potentially be expanded to, uh, to homeowners, and et cetera. Thank you. OK, how to roll out energy performance contracting on a larger scale. Um, Lawrence, you were facilitating the group which discussed Utrecht and uh, your presenter from Utrecht was Steph Rohl. Lawrence, can I invite you to give us a short? Uh, yeah, we, um, we ended up not, we sort of talked around initiatives, not so much about initiatives, but we had uh, um, a couple of conversations about the, the sort of um, different way that the different levels of government interact. That was a, a big theme for us. We had a, a person from Manitoba, a person from the government of Canada speaking to the different, uh, the different initiative, like the sort of different levels of operation and, and trying to how we talking about sort of not necessarily an initiative, but a challenge of how we share information across um, across levels of government and encourage uh, better cooperation and, and whether that's through guarantees or incentives or piloting or what what but how to uh, how to make sure that uh, that we're sort of all all pulling in the same direction without overlapping efforts. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, next in line, uh, Victoria. Victoria, you facilitated the discussion uh, about Valencia where Alejandro was the uh, speaker and the presenter of the city. Victoria, what yeah. was your 30 second highlight? Well, we talked about lots of different things. We talked about financing and capacity building and oh my goodness, a few ideas. Um, I think the one takeaway for me was just the, the success that Valencia has been having in developing a one-stop shop there to get people to renovate their um, buildings, especially given that they're so old. And then um, also the fact that they're looking at kind of scaling up by reaching out to see how um, private investment can come in. And especially in those areas where these projects are benefiting private investment to try to get them to come in and support some of the initiatives. So it's very good, very insightful. Excellent, thanks a lot, Victoria. Um, Katie, you facilitated uh, the discussion about Lille in the north of France and, and Paul, uh, was the representative of Lille. What was your highlight? Hi, yes, actually there were uh, several highlights that I'll be looking to after. Uh, Paul spoke to the Emilio program that they have, similar to what Victoria just said. It's a one-stop program to address the issue of complexity in the system for users. Like there's so many different programs at the local, regional, national level. Where do you go? Where do you start? Who are the experts that you can come in and get to do that work? Uh, so again, it's a one-stop shop uh, offering turnkey solutions, connecting homeowners and other building stakeholders with craftsmen and the education information they need. 
another thing that he mentioned uh, was this digital platform that they have to connect people with experts. Uh, but one challenge that they are facing is that they don't have, they have the, the resources, but they don't have the, enough people, enough craftsmen who are ready to do the work and at the skill they need. So this is something that they're working on as well. Uh, and they might be soliciting some ideas, but it was a really interesting conversation. Thanks very much to Paul. Okay, thank you very much. So there is more demand than supply, so to speak, for yes. renovation services. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, no, not really excellent, but it's a growth opportunity, obviously, for the um, for the construction sector. Jesse, you facilitated a discussion about Vancouver with Sean as the expert. Jesse, your highlight, please. That's right. So I'm actually going to pass it over to Sean uh, to give a little recap. I... <laughs> okay, Sean. No problem. Um, one of the things that our group found really interesting was in the province of BC where Vancouver is located, they developed a, um, a opt-in energy code for buildings. So it, we, we were finding it was very slow to upgrade the energy efficiency requirements at a provincial level, uh, political resistance and industry capacity limitations in smaller communities and rural areas. So the province developed a, a, a code structure uh, that other local governments could opt into um, and and uh, require different steps of performance. You know, somewhat better than the provincial code. The next step, but using the same metrics, very much focused on heat loss limits in Vancouver. We included G greenhouse gas limits as well, and the province is looking to integrate that now to the provincial. But what we really found was it really rapidly is advancing the province's ability to, to, to lower or improve the underlying code because you get the urban areas and the politically progressive communities opting in. Uh, and what we're finding now is more than 70% of new building starts are covered by this opt-in code that is much at, at, at steps and in often quite a bit higher than the under underlying provincial code. So that's rapidly building capacity for supply chain, professionals, uh, builders, uh, and, and enabling us to, to move the provincial standards much uh, stricter, much more quickly. John, was there any specific carrot, reward, or a benefit for uh, companies to opt in? Again, this opt-in is generally being done at a local government level. So again, uh, you know, a community, a city can say, instead of the provincial code, we, you, in, if you want to build in our community and get a building permit, you will build to step two of the step code, or you'll build to step three of the step code. So um, some, some communities are initially doing an easy step, like a step one or a step two, but saying, oh, if you are getting extra density, if you're changing the, the land use and you're getting extra density, you have to build to a higher step. So they're, okay. we're kind of using a, the base code might be step two, but if you're going through a rezoning and getting extra density, i.e. earning more profit, uh, we've created more value, then we're expecting a higher step. And, and so, uh, cities across the province are opting in. Um, okay. Oh, I, th I sent a link. There's quite a bit of information and resources. Yes. There's tons of lessons learned there. Yeah. Um, so I, it, it, as a Excellent. way of advancing code and, and rallying private and public sector players, is it, it's been super transformative. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And we'll make sure that we also include the links uh, in all the written update, which we're going to share afterwards. Um, let's move east in Canada to Ottawa, Frank, you facilitated the discussion around Ottawa where Janice was uh, presenting. Frank, can I give you the floor for a quick update, please? Sure, we had a wonderful discussion and uh, a great recommendation was to create an independent organization uh, and entrusted with the implementation of the decarbonization plan. Um, that uh, on the one hand insulates you from uh, political changes, the mayor changes, the new mayor doesn't want to be associated with the plan, and you have a more private sector approach, um, which may uh, change the manner of uh, imp implementation. A good example from Europe was mentioned as Leuven, and Ottawa said they want to do it exactly as well, so maybe we can bring the two together and talk. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, Rutger, you facilitated Toronto, where Rayanne presented the experience of their sorry, not national, the municipal uh, initiatives which Toronto is implementing. Yes, 
Yes, correct, Oliver. Yeah, we, we talked uh, starting, uh, but a starting point is the, the, the transform TO climate strategy, uh, which uh, which like also uh, contains multiple financing systems that are currently applicable in Toronto to renovate buildings. Uh, what I personally found uh, interesting to hear was that there is a great success of building related renovations repaid through property tax, similar to the base model in the United States. Um, and what I found very interesting to hear is that there is a discussion about voluntary or mandatory standards to stimulate building owners to, well, take a next step and actually uh, be activated to start uh, investing in, in renovation. And, and, and one of the participants also indicated that um, the last year uh, interest has been growing for, for these kind of things. And in order to facilitate and enlarge the reach uh, of, of renovation programs, the upfront costs should be reduced. So these were my main takeaways. Thanks a lot, Rutger. And um, the final group was facilitated by Caroline and covered at Edmonton, Edmonton, sorry, Edmonton in Alberta. And the speaker there was uh, Juan. Caroline, can you give yes. us your high, Hi. highlight yes. summary, please? Uh, we also had uh, another city uh, rep uh, from, we had Quebec as well, a representative from Quebec who was also able to speak a lot about their experience. Uh, really quick takeaways, we didn't focus as much on tools as the overall discussion on goals and strategy. Uh, Edmonton has only has really just very recently um, finalized their uh, sustainability plan, and this is part of a lot, much larger um, vision for the city that they're looking to create over the next 20, 30 years as they're also expecting a huge population growth of about a million people. And so obviously the question is how do we keep carbon neutral given this growth, and it's a real challenge. Um, key takeaways, obviously, uh, was for me, again, a couple of people have mentioned PACE, and PACE is a program that they are looking to roll out. I think that they've seen this example work well in other provinces, and uh, this is something that's starting actually as soon as this summer. Uh, I think when it comes to motivations, we didn't get into the carrot and the stick as much, but it, one interesting takeaway was that uh, I understood a survey recently what, uh, was went out um, but through a home builders association to homeowners. And again, the major, what people are actually willing to pay for, it's granite countertops, it's walk-in closets. And I think that all of us in this group, we are already the converted. We all know all the benefits of energy efficiency, but there's still a lot of work to be done to sell it and reframe energy efficiency as, um, as desirable and as just as important, if not more so. Uh, so yeah, there are a few other really great takeaways. I think one thing um, was also a key point that came up in the discussion was the importance, well, this is implicit, this was implicit in the discussion, I think the importance of alignment of a variety of actors and energy efficiency, especially in Ottawa, where the electricity is coming, it's coal fired, so it's very, very dirty electricity, it's also very cheap. So there's a lot of work to be done between aligning across stakeholders, which obviously you know, there are some other other challenges to face, but I think that was a very key takeaway, the importance of alignment if you're going to make energy Excellent. efficiency effective. Thanks a lot, Caroline. And I just wanted to say that we are going to write about one or two paras, paragraphs on each of the uh, cities which we covered today in the breakout groups, and we'll share them with you also, again, for inspiration and then individual uh, follow-up. And Caroline, you, you mentioned the need to change behavior. And that was uh, the closing of, of Eero's uh, introductory remarks. So we now have a wonderful segue into giving him the floor for the final closing uh, remark. We're already slightly above the hour, but um, uh, a few minutes uh, for Eero to close. And now before you all then leave, I just would like to invite you um, to participate in a very short survey about this webinar and about your future wishes, which will come up after the closing words from Eero, but you will see my face again in, uh, in about two minutes. So Eero, um, over to you for the final words for today. Uh, thank you, Oliver. Um, well, it, it's been a lot, a lot on the table today or on the screen rather. So uh, what we've picked up here are uh, that a couple of points. So um, I think we can see a lot of very similar issues uh, around energy efficiency on, on both sides of the, of the Atlantic here. And uh, 
and, and there are some, uh, of course, uh, international initiatives which are driving this uh, this connection or, or creating this kind of a bridge. And and I was advertising the uh, the one the global covenant of mayors in that context. Um, then there are really important national programs which which make this work easier and i think canada uh, in, in canada the green municipal fund and low carbon cities canada are, are a couple of examples not the only ones of course uh, but uh, which give concrete help to um to municipalities at, at this work and uh, if we look at then at the european side so uh eib um is uh, helping uh, exchange as well here and the elena program is a very well-established one uh, in the EU and uh, has had a strong actually impact uh, on uh, um, accelerating uh, the work at the at, uh, local level and uh, I could add that uh, actually when it was set up in back in 2008 or 2009 so this coincided uh, with, with the setup of the covenant of mayors and the logic at that time was that indeed the Elena um, facility will help the, the cities in the covenant initiative to implement their sustainable energy action plan. So that's that's a piece of history, and uh, uh, it's uh, Elena has become quite quite uh, quite a, a flagship indeed in this area. I must say as as well that it uh, um, has been then complemented by things like the EU city facility because we noticed, like it was mentioned, that sometimes the 30 million euros is already it's quite a lot of money for a smaller town that's difficult to um, to get to uh, and uh, and therefore there are there's a necessity for other other funds which give smaller grants uh, to to those cities um, of that kind anyway then i think sharing best practices is is super important on on both sides i think elena was one example but also on the canadian side it came through very clearly including in the breakouts and uh, and there uh, the uh, uh, on, on the Canadian side the uh, FCM presentation was good on on emphasizing these triple bottom benefits. I think very smart the environmental, economic, and social benefits. I think those you have to take this kind of a broad approach, and this way you can support the sectoral transformation through uh, different multi, uh, municipal projects across the country. And, uh, and another thing which came up was leveraging. So uh, you have to leverage and crowd in private investment. Uh, this is uh, really necessary. And uh, there were examples given uh, in, in, in different cities on this. But indeed, you need to deal with households, also industry and businesses. Let's not forget those. And then in some cases, the central government uh, regulation is needed to get this kind of a, a decarbonization of a city to happen and uh, with energy efficiency being in the center of it often. Um, you need to connect indeed top-down, bottom-up approaches there. And, uh, and then I think the building performance standards were mentioned as one, one way a city can, can accelerate the process. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, there was clearly a kind of a desire to, uh, to, to network between experts and, and learn on, on each other's uh, practices on this. And I would say also bad practices. I think it's good. Let's not forget those as well. We don't want to talk about them often, but I think it's important. And then, yeah, um, I think there's a lot of material for for the next material uh, for the next webinar to two one. So uh, there we go. Absolutely. Let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Iro. Um, no, as as you say, um, I mean, in the end, these webinars are. A placebo, a, a substitute for the real physical meetings, which we can currently not have, but hopefully soon again. And so I think uh, we really see these uh, webinars also as a teaser for you all in the in the audience to look deeper into the issues, to connect with the presenters, um, and uh, to share all the knowledge which we have presented today. And so I would just like to thank you all for joining us on behalf of Natural Canada and on behalf of the European Commission. I would like to thank you all, in particular the 16 people who made the breakout groups work, and of course also all the speakers who joined us today. Thank you very much. Please 
uh, fill in the short survey. It will not take more than one minute. And I would also already like to announce the next webinar where we talk about innovative financing and business models to promote energy efficiency and renovation of buildings. Uh, it will take place on the 15th of June at the same time, um, wherever you are. And of course, you will receive um, an invitation and the agenda in due time. So with that, I would like to wish you a great day. Stay safe and healthy. And I hope to see you in our next webinar in uh, about yeah four weeks from now. So thank you all for joining us and best wishes. Bye-bye.